Hello, this is David Bishai, and we're going to go through part three of our section on the role of government in health. And in this segment, we're going to solve public goods problems. So let's tell a story uh, about a public goods problems uh, to justify the idea that there will be uh, an undersupply of public goods. This is the story of the commons. A commons uh, historically was an area where all of the, the, the people of a community would uh, graze their sheep on the, the town commons. But the, the commons is also a word for any publicly available resource that suffers from a public goods problem. So in the picture, I'm showing you a lake with 100 houses uh, on the lake shore. And each house is identical. Uh, each house produces Z sub I tons of sewage per year. I runs from one to a hundred. So uh, they all find as homeowners that if they just uh, dump their sewage in the lake, it costs them zero dollars. It's just if they want to treat their sewage and buy a septic system, they have to maintain that and it's going to cost them C dollars per ton of sewage. So the total amount of sewage uh, in the lake is Z, is the sum over all of the I individuals. I goes from one to a hundred of the Z sub I's. And the total amount of sewage in the lake, uh, uh, capital Z, is gonna smell pretty bad. So the lake uh, smells worth z, which is the sum of all uh, z's. Now I've listed uh, three of the individuals at this lake. There's a total of a hundred of them. Uh, Joe produces z sub Joe. Mary produces z sub Mary. Z sub Kim for Kim. And each of them um, gets utility not from their own sewage, but they get utility from the sum of all sewage. The lake smells like all of the sewage in the lake and how much you put into it uh, is is really one one hundredth of the problem. Uh, we assume that there's you know good mixing, all of the sewage is flowing all throughout the, the lake instantaneously. So the lake smells as bad as a as, uh, hundred times each individual's pollution. So let's talk about some economics at this lake. The social benefit function, W, is the sum of all of the individual utilities, the sum of from one to a hundred of you sub I of, of capital Z. So Z is a public bad, and uh, each individual hates Z uh, because it smells so bad, and the more Z, the, the less utility. So we need to find a mechanism that makes W uh, high, and W is high when Z is low. So right away, we will consider uh, you know, a free market equilibrium and see if, if this will work out uh, and try to make some, some policies in that direction to see if that helps everybody out. Now we notice that uh, Z is the result of 100 individual contributions. And to take the individual contribution Z sub I and try to turn it into zero will cost C dollars for every individual. Now the social optimum is represented by the equation of the marginal social benefit equals the, the marginal social cost. The In calculus notation, uh, the derivative of W with respect to Z has to be equal to C. So the, the what is the, the, the change in social benefit uh, from a change in Z, that has to be equal to uh, the cost of one ton of sewage. Uh, the, the amount of welfare gained by eliminating one ton of sewage has to be equal to the cost of eliminating one ton of sewage. So here's the public goods problem. The lake smells almost the same to Mary whether or not she pollutes. So uh, the smell if Mary pollutes gives her utility U of Z, and that's almost equal to the smell if Mary doesn't pollute U of Z minus Z of Mary, because she's only one one hundredth of the problem. 
So Mary or any free rider will observe that the marginal benefit, the derivative of their own utility with respect to their own pollution is close to zero because if they default and just send their sewage into the lake, it doesn't change the smell. So if Mary treats her sewage, uh, uh, her utility is the same, but she is definitely negative by uh, the C times Z. It costs her uh, C dollars per unit of sewage. So she has no interest in uh, paying marginal benefit less than marginal cost. She won't benefit from the decrement to, to her own sewage. So the individual marginal individual decision is based on uh, an individual calculation of marginal benefit for an individual equal marginal cost and that comes out differently from the the social calculation so we saw that the social calculation was be dw by dz equals c but for individuals the calculation is uh, the derivative of individual utility from an in, a, a decrement in z being equal to cost but here we've realized that the individual benefit from one individual decision to treat sewage is almost zero. But for society, uh, a different calculation comes out. So we think through, could we solve this, this uh, public goods problem? Now, one bilateral trade, if Mary and Kim made a mutual pact, or if we put them in a free market and Mary finds Kim and they say, look, I will treat my sewage if you'll treat your sewage, uh, would that solve it? No, because we need 50 people to simultaneously find each other and find the lawyers and make a pact. And if only two people eliminate their sewage, the lake still, still smells 98% bad. We have to keep scaling up this uh, ability to find each other and make a pact. So a free market solution uh, is probably going to lead to a polluted lake and a lack of Pareto optimality because on a, on a social scale, the marginal benefit of eliminating one ton of sewage, dw by d big Z equaling c, is is achievable, uh, but only if everybody chips in and simultaneously does that. This society doesn't have uh, a way to scale up all of these these trades. What Mary can offer Kim and what Kim can offer Mary don't cut it. They doesn't give them what they want, and so they they won't undergo the trade. Um, so again, if you look at this slide, uh, you'll see that um, there's a little explanation on how to get us to 50 bilateral trades all at the same time. And there's a real reason to do that, because change in the aggregate smell is still worth a lot. Uh, the social benefit, as shown, uh, is, is still the sum of all of those utilities, and the the change in social welfare from changing the the aggregate public bad is far from zero, uh, and so it would be great to solve it. So the free market solution uh, leads to a situation that's not Pareto optimal. The, the, the residents of the lake community uh, can be made better off without anybody being made worse off, but they can't get there uh, on their own. But they need to solve their public goods problem. Now, if, if this were your community, I'm sure you could think through what to do and think for a minute on what you would do. And I hope you're thinking, there's only a hundred of them. Let's go door to door. Let's get them into an association. And it's exactly the right thing to think. If these Lakeshore community could form an association, um, they could solve it. And let's call that a club. So basically what they need to do is to do what all civilizations have done to solve public goods problems. They need to transform their public good problem to a club good problem. Um, a club can be a nation, a state, or a city, or the members of the citizens on the lake. So step one is to form a group. They have to go door to door and get members to join the group. Step two, they have to 
take up a collection uh, to do something. Now, this, they could spend the money uh, providing the public good or punishing the provision of the public bad, uh, something with the money. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. Step four uh, is the guidance step. Uh, ideally, and this almost never happens, uh, these clubs would hire an economist to actually identify the point at which marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. The economist, if they were in this uh, solution, would measure the W function. They would measure all of those utilities and the sum of the utilities, and they would form a model of DW by DZ to tell the people in this club the right amount of social good to produce. If you don't get to step four, the club is probably going to overdo it or underdo it, and they'll have too much or too little public good. But ideally, they will uh, find a way to measure the right amount of social benefit and provide the right amount of, of social benefit relative to the cost. Now, the club, once it forms, has two choices. What could it do? It could centrally provide the public good. It could socialize the services and take over so that the services are provided by the club. The club could provide the schools, health care, sanitation, pollution control. The club could uh, pipe in sewage pipes to every house on the lake and because it has their, their collective uh, tax revenue, uh, equalize the payment for the provision of the public good. As economists, though, there are uh, uh, ways to use clubs and not have to buy, have centralized provision of the public good. So and, and a free market style solution to the problem, after the club is formed, if the members of the club could assign rights and reduce transaction costs, they could meet each other and form a series of trades with each other, given that they have a property right to the thing that they care about, they could trade for it. As long as we have rights and the ability to form the trades, we could marketize the solution uh, as an alternative to public goods. But the question is, how easy is it to assign rights, to guard the rights, to litigate the rights? How easy is it to make the deals and the transaction costs? So this idea uh, comes into uh, how we might get to a market solution. If we assign liability, we would say that anybody on the lake has the right to sue a polluter of the lake. And you go to the judge and say, I saw Mary polluting the lake. I'm going to sue her and she has to pay damages. Another approach is to assign a right to emit pollutants. Now, everybody has owns the property right to be a polluter and can sell away that right for money. So Mary can hold up a piece of paper that says, I have this permission slip from the government, from the club that lets me pollute. I'll sell it to you. And once I lose my permission slip, I can't pollute anymore. And then you'd have to sue me uh, for violating my, uh, my regulation. So if we've assigned the rights and we allow the polluter and the polluted victim to find each other and make a deal, uh, the market could solve this. If all mutual no pollute packs are free, and can be costlessly enforced, then the economists predict that the rational lake dollars will instantaneously all enter mutual no pollute packs. They will trade uh, off their uh, liability or their rights and the lake is clean. However, if there are no rights or liabilities assigned and it costs them money to find each other, the lake will stay polluted. So we've got these conditions for a market solution to a public goods problem that rights are assigned, liabilities are assigned, and transaction costs are zero. Now, it's, it's a little bit astonishing that it doesn't matter whether you've assigned rights to the polluter or the pollutant, but let me help explain that. Suppose the regulator says that the victim of pollution has the right. Everybody at the lake says 
has a document that says, I have the right to have a clean lake and I can sue offenders because of my right. Uh, lawsuits are free. I've assumed away transaction costs. All hundred lake dwellers will sue anybody who pollutes. And if Mary decides to pollute, uh, the judge awards damages of C dollars to the plaintiff uh, and the C dollars of damages will be used uh, to clean up the sewage. So we've sued Mary for polluting. The judge says, you know, what does the damage do here? The damage is a damage where the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. Alternatively, the regulator assigns the rights to the polluter. And now you're a polluter and you say, you hold a piece of paper that says, I have the right to emit sewage. Uh, now the club could collect donations of C dollars per citizen, and you could buy off those permits and say to everybody holding a permit to buy suit to pollute for C dollars, I will buy off your pollution permit. And you know, you're, you've, you're made whole marginal benefit equals marginal cost. You've lost your right to emit sewage, but you take in C dollars and you install the septic system and clean up your sewage and everybody's happy. So we've solved the problem, whether we've assigned the rights to the victims or the, the polluters. But again, critical is that We've actually assigned the rights and then the transaction costs are free. If the transaction costs are not free, it's not a good idea to use the market approach. And where transaction costs are really forbidding, you might go off to the command and control solution. And in command and control, you have a police officer or environmental inspector measure the sewage emitted at each house, identify a sewage submission uh, technology, uh, measure social willingness to pay to reduce sewage and use coercive sanctions to force the polluter to produce a socially efficient amount of sewage. Again, in order for this to happen, ideally, we have to know when is the point of stopping. At what point is the lake just right? If there is an optimal amount of pollution in the lake, uh, where the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost. The lake could be dirtier than that or cleaner than that, and either one of those is a problem. The just right point is where benefit e marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So in the command and control solution, we might ask a panel of public health scientists uh, to set emission standards, but even better would be to measure preferences and ask people their their utility of pollution and their marginal utility of pollution and compare that to costs. So I think we've built enough foundation now to talk about Ronald Coase's remarkable theorem. Coase's theorem said, so Coase's theorem is quite remarkable and it says that the optimal pollution occurs if all rights are assigned and transaction costs are zero. And when Coase says optimal pollution, he means optimal in the sense of marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost optimal. Coase's corollary to this is that if you live in a world full of rights to sue and the right to emit, if you observe pollution, that means that there are high transaction costs. It means that the, the polluter and the pollutee couldn't find each other. And the remarkable part about Coase's theorem is that it doesn't matter how you assign the rights. A tradable right to pollute works as well as a tradable right to breathe clean air. So in terms of uh, should we use markets or command and control? Well, the market solutions disadvantages are magnified when there are high transaction costs. If you have a million people trying to sue a factory or an NGO trying to collect a million donations to take on collective action, uh, it's much more difficult uh, in that situation. But command and control has disadvantages because you have to uh, set up um, an inspection operation and the inspectors have to have the, the tools of the state to coerce the polluters. Uh, if you think about uh, uh, the coronavirus epidemic of 2020, uh, we have the situation where the pollution is coming from the mouth and nose of every individual. 
And uh, the command and control disadvantage is the team of inspectors and incentives to uh, try to get people to wear masks and social distance. Difficult to get that many inspectors. Uh, the market solution to the, the COVID control pollution of the, 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 the aerosols coming from the mouth and nose is that we, we uh, would spend all day transacting deals and paying our, our neighbors at the grocery store to wear a mask. The transaction costs are quite, quite difficult. So uh, the coronavirus uh, epidemic is, is a bit of a public goods problem where neither the market solution nor the command and control solution uh, recommends itself. But a real disadvantage of command and control is that it doesn't have an automatic way to get a signal about how much each victim or each polluter values uh, the pollution problem. Uh, the information about how they, they, their utility scales with the pollution is known only to the victim. And it's revealed when they actually go make trades in well-functioning markets. Regulators who don't listen to this information about market trades won't get it right. And they're likely to overdo the, the, the regulation and clean up the situation much more so than needs to be cleaned. So public provision creates social problems. If we have uh, uh, a problem of not having enough public goods, we could solve it with public provision, but now we're going to have a real problem, and the, it's a problem in every single club and every single government, of conflict over what public goods to provide and how much public goods to provide. This conflict plays out differently in democracies and dictatorships, but the conflict will always be there. And the root of the conflict is heterogeneous enjoyment of any public good in any club. Unless and until all human beings have exactly identical preferences, people are not going to agree on how much they like the public good. For the lake, perhaps they agree to some extent on how bad the smell affects them. But for most public goods, there's a lot of disagreement about the enjoyment of the public good. Let me try to illustrate this with uh, a central air conditioning problem. Suppose we have uh, a, a frat house. There are 20 frat brothers living in the frat house. It's uh, September, it's really hot, and they have central air. And they have to have one temperature setting on the air conditioner. They can set it at 65, 66, all the way up to 74 degrees on the thermostat but it can't be both at the same time. Now, what I've drawn here is uh, a survey of the, the 20 members uh, on what temperature they thought was ideal. And it looks to me like uh, the mean was about 69 degrees. So the, the number one choice of the people in the frat was that uh, 69 degrees was the ideal temperature. Now, unfortunately, this was only true for 40% uh, uh, of the people in the frat house. The other 60% were evenly divided, saying they would like a hotter temperature or a cooler temperature. Uh, the people on the right said that the frat house was too cold. Uh, they want the temperature turned up. They want it to be 70, 71, 73, or 74 degrees. Uh, there were people on the left who said, no, no, it's still too hot. Turn uh, down the temperature on the thermostat. So they're saying uh, they'd like it cooler in the frat. So I've got uh, a problem. I've got uh, an energy bill divided among the frat brothers, so each of them has to pay $20 a month. I found that eight of the frat brothers are exactly happy. They love it at 69 degrees. And in this uh, efficient economy, uh, where the, the average frat house is set at 69 degrees, uh, I'm sure the utility company is pricing it so that the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. And these eight frat brothers at 69 degrees are getting marginal benefit exactly equal to their marginal cost. They are at the efficient point at $20. However, uh, 
On the right, there are six frat brothers who said it should be cooler. Uh, they're not happy. They are paying $20 and getting marginal benefit less than $20. And there are six who say it should be hotter, and they are paying $20 and getting marginal benefit less than $20. We got 12 unhappy people and eight happy people in this house. What are the 12 unhappy ones going to do? Well, some are going to become politically active and get into frat house politics. Uh, some are just going to buy sweaters and just deal with it. Perhaps, uh, you know, if it's only $20 a month after a few years, um, getting a sweater might be worth the money. Some will be so disgusted that uh, the house didn't respect their preferences that they're going to leave and find a house where the temperature is set more to their liking. So let's talk about what the, the politically active ones are going to do. The people uh, on the left side of the preference distribution, uh, the ones that say, I want it to be cooler, uh, they're going to be competing for the ones that say, I want it to be hotter. They're going to be tugging at each other, saying, we want the thermostat moved in our direction. They're going to recast their private goods of what they want for themselves as public goods, as everybody should want what I want to get the public to pay for it. So if you were uh, pitching your point of view at the frat meeting uh, on uh, September night, you would go to the frat meeting with a slogan like, um, we need to set the temperature hotter because it saves energy. We need to save the polar bears from uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we want to make sure the temperature is set at my setting because it's better for health. We would make these appeals. They would be politically ready to do quid pro quo. They would say, well, I'll volunteer more at the charity if I get my temperature. There'd be a lot of, of um, political action going on uh, in, in order for this frat to keep going. But a major point is that because of heterogeneous preferences, we go back to this curve, it looks like they did the perfect right thing. But underneath this is that only eight people achieved a personal sense of, of marginal benefit equals marginal cost, and a majority didn't get what they wanted and had marginal benefit less than marginal cost, and they're unhappy. So we've solved a social goods problem, but because of heterogeneous, very widely spaced preferences, we've created widespread unhappiness. Now, are they better off with the air conditioning at all? Yeah, because without the air conditioning, the temperature in September would probably be 85 or 90 in the house. But just the same, they've still got inefficiency left over because they, they cannot get uh, individually micro-controlled air conditioning and there's a central air conditioning and there is a public goods problem and no level of public goods pleases everybody. Let's get ready to talk about health, because we're going to have this type of heterogeneous preferences problem in health. And for our key public goods in health, remember what they are. The quality of health services, caring for the vulnerable, shared risks from air and water and contagion, and controlling the waste in the health system. Are there heterogeneous preferences? And yes, there are. Uh, think to yourself, who would be in the interest group? where they would be saying, we would need more, more, more. And who would be in the interest group where they would be saying, we need less, less, less. And when you think about the actual interest groups that argue for more, 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 and less, 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 are they actually rational? Are we finding that, that, that they are actually acting in their best interest? For instance, in the, the interest groups in the U.S. politics that say uh, caring for the vulnerable is their public good. They want our health system to ensure uh, the, the weak. Uh, who would want to do that? Well, you know, if it would be rational for those who suffered from illness to want to care for the vulnerable so that they don't get tuberculosis from them. Or it would be rational for those who felt that they were going to have a child that um, was unemployed um, would care for the vulnerable. Or somebody who felt that they might lose their job might want to uh, advocate for caring for the vulnerable. And yet the real interest groups in the American debate over caring for the vulnerable are not aligned according to rationality. This is weird. And this remains puzzling to a lot of people. And we need to discuss this. So let's summarize. 
In this class, we have had several parts. We've talked in part one about Pareto optimality. We've concluded that Pareto optimality is worth achieving, but it is not everything you want in an economy or in society. It leaves out fairness, justice, and equity. It doesn't recognize the obstacles that very different individuals are facing. We've defined efficiency the way economists define efficiency as the marginal benefit equaling the marginal cost. We've taken a look at public goods and we've announced that there are four critical public goods in the health system, protecting the vulnerable, ensuring quality, controlling shared risks from social and physical space, and controlling wasteful practices. This is something that are things that are non-rival and non-excludable for people in a community. And as governments solve public goods problems, they have to choose whether they will collectively finance and provide public goods uh, to directly manage who gets what, or try to regulate them into club goods to try to lower the transaction cost between beneficiary and supplier and, and solve the, the obstacles to a market-based solution to the public goods problems. These problems are, are immense. They will be with you throughout your life as citizens and workers, and it's important to be attuned to the, the very intricate economics and how economics can contribute to solving these.